So welcome to the Rise of the Super Being podcast. That's the season number three. I'm super happy to be one more year here sharing stories from our community to you guys. And today my guest is John Pengeli. So John broke the world record twice of spear fishing. So John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And also, of course, you've been practicing jiu-jitsu as well. No? So we're going to talk a, a lot about uh, how those, those two things can, can cross over, you know, the lessons between those, those two things. So, John, first, my friend, how's, how's the journey of jiu-jitsu has been so far? Oh, it's, it's been amazing. Yeah, I think, I think I counted up this morning, just coming up on nine months now. Nine months? Yeah, mm. and I, f I feel like I started yesterday type thing. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, yeah, just, just to be... Right back at the bottom of the chain, total beginner. It's yeah, one of my favorite places to be. So, enjoying every moment of it at the moment. Ah, uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so John, let's just start. You know, because me and this is such a uh, interesting topic. You know, so when when you came to to the class and and other guys was pointed out, oh, John has the world record of spare fishing. Me and I was so blown away by that, you know, because first I'm, 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 I'm going to say I'm super ignorant about water sport because coming from, you know, the place I came from, Brazil, was pretty dry. It wasn't the ocean around at all. You know, I saw the ocean for the first time when I was 14. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I, you know, I never practiced anything, you know, on the water. So how does, how does this journey is, is started from you? So how did you end up in, you know, going to this, this type of a sport and, and how did you became what you, you became? Yeah. So for me, it was, it was probably something I was always drawn to in some way. I remember being oh, very, very early age primary school, maybe eight years old. Mm. And had a bit of a fixation with holding my breath and seeing how far I could swim in like the family pool and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And even at that age, I remember doing like maybe five laps underwater of a small kidney bean pool and coming up with headaches like CO2 headaches and stuff like that. So I, I had to be pushing myself to some level even at that age. And for what reason? I, I don't know, maybe just early competitive nature or something mm -hmm. um but yeah the, the water and the ocean was the probably just drawing me from an early age i love fishing um but there was a decent gap between those early ages where i was um fi liked fishing and swimming in the pool to where i actually got into spear fishing and free diving because i was initially actually very nervous and a little bit scared of the ocean mm-hmm um, just from growing up around people like my, my granddad, who was a pro fisherman, he had lots of shark stories and stuff like uh, that. <laughs> but um, sooner or later, I was dragged out um, with my dad and his friends and got introduced to it. And then eventually I met a, a guy who's still my best friend today, who um, was the same age as me. Mm -hmm. And we, he invited me out for a day spearfishing with him and his dad. And it was just one of those days where you um those memories that are burnt in your head forever you the thousands of fish swimming around you crystal clean water um and it's like that that moment that you're like okay i'm going to do this for the rest of my life type thing mm. so that that was the beginning beginning of the end type thing for me yeah that's so awesome yeah and i can imagine well i can't imagine what what you have seen under under the water because i mean it's it's another completely different world right It, it, it is, yeah, it's, um, I always think of it as, like, it is a, it's its own world, it's perfectly natural the, under the ocean, but we are the aliens that enter into it. Yeah. <laughs> Everything that's happening in there is day-to-day -day business, as if we were sitting here walking the street, uh, you're yeah, training yeah. jiu-jitsu or whatever, and then an alien comes down from the sky. <laughs> that's us in their environment. Um, and it's, it is a whole other world that a lot of people haven't experienced and they're, they're missing out, yeah. Mm. Yep. What was the most impressive thing did you see under the, under the water? Um, it's a hard one, I suppose. Um, I, I've seen, I've had amazing interactions with different types of fish and sharks, which are some of my all-time highlights like um there was a there is a lady who's a good friend of mine and she was uh, my became my, my free dive instructor for many years um and when she first moved over to my hometown uh, the very first day we we ever took her out on the reef diving she got to have one of the most amazing encounters with a big tiger shark um, so they're usually pretty big and uh 
you are wary of them. They, they have been known to to eat people and, and fish <laughs> and stuff like that. But they're a little bit more of a slower giant type thing that you you don't want to give them too much rope, but you can kind of handle yourself around them as long as you don't let them sneak up on you type mm. thing. But um, yeah, her very first day on the ocean, um, we were sitting in some crystal clean water, 20 meters deep, coral reef, colorful reef all around us. And she's come from New Zealand. She was living here in Wellington at the time. And so used to very dirty water. Um, and we had a wonderful day diving, but right at the end of the day, um, I heard this, this shout and we, turned around and this big tiger shark came in. It was about four, four and a half metres long. It's huge, Holy like mm. almost like a metre across its head. Um, and just the characteristics of it and its uh, interaction with us was insane. It, it came in and we spent like half an hour swimming with it and it would like, it would swim along doing its own thing. You could get close to it, almost pat it if you liked, but if you got too much in its space, it would turn around and be like, hey get you to back off a bit but there was one stage in the water where we're, it just turned up uh, like yeah pretty much vertical and it swam all the way up to the surface about from your knee to to me away holy and like its head is like yeah nearly a meter wide mm. and it just sat there like blinking at us almost like i don't know it's hard to explain um, especially to someone that uh, probably hasn't experienced it before but you almost have like it's almost like you're talking in English to them the, the, when you spend so much uh, time interacting with an animal like that, especially one you've got so much respect for, because you know it could it could take a limb off at any time if it wanted to. <laughs> um, and the, just the characteristics of it too. It had this big bent over dorsal fin, a big scar up the side of its face, and mm. so yeah, there's moments like that um, that'll be burnt in my head forever. For wow, sure. man, yeah. that's in, that's amazing. That's amazing. And John, how the how's the training? So how long how how long can how did you build to be able to hold your breath? How, what was the the longest you could you was able to hold your breath under the water? Um, time wise, mm. um, for me, uh, I was I would call myself an, an average freediver, I suppose, mm. compared to what the capabilities of people out there are. My longest was, I think, around five minutes 35. Wow. Um, five minutes 35. Yeah. So for me, it was an accomplishment. Um, mm. and, and I had to work very hard to get up over five minutes. Um, there are people out there holding their breath for over 10 minutes. Um, wow. So it's... It, yeah, is it's, that a human possible? <laughs> it, it is, yeah. It's, it's, um, it, it's definitely possible. It's one of the cool things about free diving, though, is like you've got these extremes and these elite athletes that are like amazing to, to look at and their capabilities but the mm. free diving itself it's it's not about the people around you or the people you're competing against it's it's you're improving yourself your, your battle is against yourself and no one else so that's why it's um so enticing i suppose to go back to your your question about what was it like learning um and getting into it mm. um it was never really viewed as a as a progression, a lineal progression or anything like that. We enjoyed it. We had so much fun doing it and it was our lifestyle mm. that every spare moment that we got that we could go out, especially once we got, we started working and making our own money and own time, we would be out doing it. Mainly, there was a good chunk, many years there where we were diving three days a week, every week, mm -hmm. um, from dawn till dusk, pretty much. Wow. And so we're not going out with the thought of how we can get better and... and what what we want to do each day it's more just you're, you're living in the moment you're out there you're enjoying it because it's what you love doing and through progression of time that skill is going to build up without you um knowing if you're not paying a closer close enough attention to it type thing mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah, yeah yeah so john just before we go more deep on this this subject this topic you know i ask you about you know what's the most memorable experience under the water but What's what's the what's the worst? Uh, did you ever been attacked by I don't know a shark? Yeah, for, for example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As we talk about sharks, how yeah. was that? Uh? Um, yeah, so I suppose that probably would have to be one of my one of my worst. It's it, it's a pretty cool story to tell now, so I don't mm. really view it as a as a negative experience these uh -huh. days. But yeah, I, I did. I was attacked by a um a bull shark when I was about. I can't even remember now. I think it was maybe 1920. Um, I 
we're, we're, me and some friends were out diving on a reef and it was a, a beautiful day, like crystal clean water, 30 metres visibility. Um, and we'd just gotten in the water on this reef and done our first drift. And right at the end of the drift, I've um, done this, I, I did a drop down to the bottom in 20 metres and I had a little mangrove jack come in, which is a type of fish. Um, and I lined it up, pulled the trigger and got what we call a stone shot on it. You break its spine, it's instant, instant death for it, so painless. Mm. Um, and I went to return to the surface, but as I returned to the surface, there was a, a piece of my shaft, the spear that we shoot out of the guns into the fish, caught on the bottom. So I had to drop my gun and go back to the surface for, uh, for some breath. And while I was on the surface, about this distance from you and I right now, um, I was talking to my mate and out of like, in a, in a flash, out of nowhere, I remember feeling this really big impact in my chest, mm. almost like, um, like, a, like a prop from rugby um, shoulder charging you. And it launched me from about up to my waist out of the water. And so all, all this ha probably happened in the space of a couple of, like a second or two, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But to me, it feels like a couple of minutes with yeah. the way I run through it. But yeah, so I was launched up to about my waist out of the water. Um, I remember seeing this big grey mass shape in front of me. And as I come back down into the water, it flopped down and then took off. And at that stage, uh, it's all a bit blurry. I think I was um, experiencing like just... Half of my brain must have known that I'd been hit by a shark. The other half was still wondering wow. and, and reacting to it. Um, and um, after, a, after what felt like a couple of minutes, but was probably one or two seconds, I noticed that there was a lot of blood in the water mm. and probably about like a metre radius cloud around me. And I kept putting my head back down in the water subconsciously. I think I must have known that it was a, a shark and I'd been bitten by this stage. So I was putting my head down in the water looking around for the shark. And at the same time, I remember feeling my chest like this. Thinking, wow. Think because it initially hit me here. Mm. So I was like, oh, has it, have I been, had a chunk taken out of my chest or, or what's happened? And that's when I, yeah, I realized the blood and then settled down enough because my friend that was right beside me had just grabbed me straight away. And he must have realized it was my arm that was ripped apart. Um, and so he was holding on to my arm with one hand and then grabbing my head with the other and pulling it above the water and telling mm. me to breathe and, and like trying to calm me. Mm -hmm. He was like, breathe, breathe. You're okay. We got you. It's gone. The shark's gone. Um, and at that stage, we yelled out. Well, sorry, before that, um, one of the moments I really clearly remember is he looked at me and he just like told me, yeah, breathe. Are you look, we're all good, we're going to get back to the boat, are you okay? And I took a couple of breaths and that was enough to, to, to calm me enough to put me back into the present moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I stopped and then I actually asked him if he was okay. And he, <laughs> <laughs> he laughed at me and then um, and asked me why I was asking him if he was okay and all that sort of carry on. We exchanged a few friendly words uh -huh. that I won't repeat on here. Um, and, then, <laughs> and we waited for the boat and the boat came over and picked us up. Um, so... From there, it was getting into the boat. Um, there was probably one of the most gory parts of the day was at that stage there where my mate um, had to let go of my arm to get into the boat. And then so the two, two friends could help drag me into the boat. And as soon as he let go, my instinct was to try and stop the bleeding. So I grabbed hold of my arm. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I like felt that I was, it was just two bones left there pretty much. Just one, oh, two. So it was man. just like hand on bone and I can still feel that feeling now of just like yeah, man, and this scar on your arm it's massive yeah it's massive so um now yeah now be, uh, I, I, looks, never, yeah. I never pay attention before you know even because we always you know wear the gi or the rash guard but now you're talking and you you put your hand there man it's massive yeah yeah it's definitely messed up a bit it ended mm. up taking out um pretty much all the muscles and, and tendons wow two, two of the artery uh one, one artery and two nerves mm. um so it for for the little area that it managed to get it definitely done a good bit of damage wow so what's happened next um so then we were dragged yeah i got dragged into the boat mm. and we were lucky enough we had all been reasonably well first aid trained um so we were it was 
straight into emergency mode really we started cutting the rubbers off our spear guns and using them for tourniquets tying around the arm to stop the blood because it was literally a lot of blood was coming out of my arm at this stage um and my mate took uh, took a shirt and started shoving a shirt down inside my arm um, wow so he could like crimp onto it and, and hold it um and from there it was like we just we needed to get to the the we needed to get help really and there was an island about 18 kilometers away um so fr from there 18 kilometers eight, away yeah so we were we were over 70 kilometers offshore at this stage mm. so if that island wasn't there then yeah I, I would have bled out on the way back to shore for sure but um luckily that island we had there was an island where we were this day only um, 18 kilometers away so it was hammered down from there um and yeah so tourniquets on legs were elevated to try and keep keep the blood um flowing around and th the three of us were pretty much just telling jokes to each other and and trying to laugh off any any nerves and that we had at this stage pretty much the whole way back to the island mm. um looking back now i i, I thought I, I had a I was reasonably conscious and everything was okay, but I talked to my mates who were looking after me and, yeah, they said that I was starting to fade in and out of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but by the time we got back to the the island, um, they had help sitting on the, on the dock, on the jetty. Uh, there was a nurse there. It was only a small little tourist island. So there was a nurse sitting there and they um, carried me up and put me on the stretcher and took me into the little first aid ward they have there. Um, and from there, the nurse had to pull tourniquets and the shirts out and start shoving more gauze and that back down into my arms. Um, she managed to bandage it up and they actually had a bit of morphine and stuff there as well. Um, so they, they booted me up with that, which um, was an interesting experience. But yeah, it took a lot of the pain away. Um, and maybe about an hour, hour and a half later, a helicopter arrived mm. and they brought a full medical team out with doctors and they did uh, two rounds of blood transfusions on me um, to pump blood back into me because I'd lost too much to move. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember how much exactly it was, but yeah, they, it took them about another 45 minutes of um, stabilising and blood transfusions before they could put me on the helicopter. And then we flew from there to one of the nearest towns and they put me on an aeroplane. And from the aeroplane, I flew to Brisbane, about 600 kilometres away and straight into surgery and then two weeks in hospital. Holy, yeah. what a story. In this, you talk about, you You said you was 19, 20 years old. Yep, yep. Wow. So in the, what, was, what, the, what was going on through your mind in some, in some stage? Because... I mean, I think if, if I had, if I just look at you to my arm, I think I would pass out straight away. Yeah. So do you, do you have any recognition of what was going on through your mind? Yeah, there's a couple of points. Uh, like I, the, I do remember the, the one point of like, yeah, grabbing hold of the, the two bones when I was getting into the boat. And that still gives me like a bit of a gut churning mm. feeling because I remember that feeling of like recognizing oh, those bones. Man. Um, but once we were in the boat, tourniquets were going on it was really just reactive at this stage so um we were all working together um we were telling jokes to keep each other calm mm. like my mates were paying me out trust me to be the one that gets bitten by a shark at the start of the day when we've just started getting spear, uh -huh. spear fishing <laughs> and ruining the day for them and all uh. this sort of stuff um but um other things i remember feeling is like in the boat when we were cruising back in there was a couple of moments where you'd, you'd sit there and i um was i suppose sitting there just being um thinking a bit about okay this is an actual serious life-threatening situation right now so everything that we do from here out matters this isn't a game anymore mm -hmm. um so there was a, a sense of seriousness although we we're trying to keep each other calm by telling jokes and that there also was everything that was done was piece by piece and meant to be done uh, after that mm -hmm. which was um it's probably a hard thing to describe i suppose but it's um yeah w one thing i've noticed in a lot of serious situations over the years that you get into you seem to snap into a certain mind frame in, in a situation like that and um and everyone else is on the same page um 
So I, I remember that. I remember getting into the first aid place on the island and the nurse looking at my mate and asking how bad it was. And my mate said, oh, it's, it's pretty bad. And then I, I remember taking the, the shirts and that off and then just feeling like warm blood gushing down my arm oh. type stuff. And that's oh. another really sick feeling I, I remember. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once the nurse got the gauze on and everything, at that stage I felt pretty comfortable and relaxed enough it might have been the morphine but I, f- I felt like okay I'm sorted now I think I'm through the worst of it I just want to wake up after surgery in eight hours or whatever time it is from now and get on with my recovery um is at a pretty early stage yeah I was whether that was the right thought or not but yeah I, I felt reasonably comfortable once once I got to help and the doctors were there doing the blood transfusions and all that sort of stuff but I was pretty heavily on morphine and lost a lot of blood by this stage, so probably wasn't thinking too straight either. Wow. Um, yeah. Holy. So, John, so after that, how was your return to the ocean? I would never go back to the ocean after something like that. How was for you the return to, to do that? I mean, what a, how, how was the, the work on your mind as well, not to be able to... Yep. So, uh, spearfishing and freediving was my life at this stage, so... There was no way I was going to, to stop. Mm. I, I spent my first weekend away spearfishing three months after the attack for two days with my friends, and that was took me four months to get back to work. Mm-hmm. So a month before I could go to work, I was back in the water. Um, it definitely did have some psychological stuff, though, for sure. Like, I remember my friends came into the water... Uh, sorry, my friend that was in the water with me when I got bitten... He came down to visit me in hospital and he was telling me a story. He went out diving that day before he came into hospital and he was saying that even his heart rate and everything was, was a bit more nervous around sharks. He had a, like a, a big hammerhead come in and buzz him on, this, um, on the day before he came and visited me. And as he was talking about the shark, the monitor beside me that monitors your pulse... You could see my pulse climbing and climbing and climbing. Mm. And to me, I wasn't mm. like, I was like happy listening to the story and that, but he pointed it out. He goes, as soon as I started talking about sharks, your heart rate started climbing. Wow. Um, so the subconscious mind, you know, it's already yeah. activating. Yeah. Wow. So there was that side of things. Um, but yeah, it, it was one of those things that it was such a big part of my life, um, physically and spiritually and all that sort of stuff, the ocean at that stage that... I was never going to be kept away from it. It was a, uh, I'm going to have to learn to live with it and get back in there regardless type thing. So mm. um, I definitely was a lot more cautious. I think the a big lesson that came out of that whole experience was the the saying that you, that people say about the fine line between bravery and stupidity. Mm. Um, beforehand, we'd do we'd happily dive in areas where there were lots of sharks feeding really aggressively, and the, your attitude was, uh, "They're not going to eat me." How many people do you have you heard of that get bitten? Running statistics through your head, uh-huh. but when you become that small little statistic and all that sort of stuff, you have to start realizing the threat of what you're doing and weighing it up if it's something you want to do and if it's what you want to do, and you've weighed up all the emotions, and that's I think where you start moving into the away from the stupidity side, you're, you're doing stuff, like stupidity side to me is doing something without knowing the consequence. And then the, the bravery side is knowing the consequence of something, but doing it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, if that makes sense, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it, was yeah. A bit, it was a learning curve for me to, to pick my battles a little bit more and mm-hmm. not, not be so frivolous. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like what you said. You know, yeah, when we become the number, not the statistic, mm-hmm. things change, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. So, John, how about the? Okay, so yeah, that's that's the worst one. Of the worst things ever happened to you, right? But when 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 you're free diving and you know something something goes wrong, with the breath, uh, you know, start to you know giving some sign of okay, I need some air. Mm. What what's what's the what, what do you do? What's going on to your mind? Yeah, so this is. Um, something that only comes with time and experience. I, mm. I suppose it's a, everyone will have a different answer to that. But anyone that's been in the water for a long time and has experienced um, severe hypoxia um, and maybe blackouts and, and trained in freediving and that sort of stuff, you actually get to a stage where 
you might be like, like every dive we do when we're diving deep we might we won't be pushing ourselves to our limit hopefully but mm. you will feel a high level of carbon dioxide start to uh, build up in your body and your body starts to mitigate and do do things to keep you alive most people that if they were thrust straight into that environment are going to feel like they're dying right then and there type thing but over time because this is something the body naturally does and we've learned to recognize this um we we learn to harness that 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 ability um and use it to our advantage um for example like if you were say we were swimming underwater and all of a sudden you become tangled and you're you're stuck there's a couple of different options your main two options are going to be panic and start to rip everything off you run out of oxygen and probably drown unless someone can come down and get you Mm -hmm. or you can do the thing that's most likely going to be successful and keep you alive is stop all right there's a problem a life-threatening problem right now um the only way I can sort this is by conserving my oxygen, sorting the immediate problem out, and then getting to the surface to get some air. So panicking in those situations um, are going to make it worse. Your heart rate's going to increase. Um, you're not going to think straight. To be able to stop, focus, and be centered on the problem right in front of you right then and there um, it, it is something you're going to need to rely on to keep you alive in those situations, I suppose. So, mm. so you're going back to your question. I, I think it's, um, if you are presented with situations like that, hopefully you have spent enough time over the years to realize and recognize that the issue in front of you is the one to solve first panicking, uh, is, is going to be your enemy and being calm, focused and, giving your body every chance it has to survive is, is going to be the, the key, the critical items. To, mm-hmm. yeah. mm, that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah so interesting, John. That I, I love what you said as well about the, the, you know, the passion for the sport, you know, because, well, for the activity, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a sport as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, so the, the, this passion for, you know, always give, give you the... the the strength to go back even when something something bad is happening. Yep. Another another thing as well is the what's the training, John? So for example, you know in Jiu-Jitsu we have the belt, right? So we start as a white belt and yep. go to. So for example, if I want to go to you know to to be able to to do what what you do, what's the what's the beginner? What's the white belt steps towards that? Um, so two sides of it if if the free diving side or the spear fishing side let's start with the free diving free diving yeah. side so the f- for free diving side v- very basic beginner level will be getting in the water and comfortable in the water to start with mm-hmm. um if if i was to take someone into the pool to introduce them to breath hold and free diving we might do a maybe a, a, a static breath hold session to to start with so static is a discipline in freediving where you lie face down and you hold your breath for as long as you can without moving, saving and conserving your oxygen. Mm-hmm. Um, so as a part of that, um, it's a very easy, easy way to get someone in, into the water and help them understand um, what, what it's going to feel like to feel hypoxia, to carbon dioxide build up in your body, um, in a control environment in the pool um, and um, initiate some technique, I suppose, mm-hmm. for it. It's a very simple, you'll be lying face down in the water and for X amount of time you might have someone timing you beside you and there's a, a bit of a protocol on the way you get up by holding onto the side of the pool. Um, but, yeah, I suppose if, if that's probably the, the very early part um, I would introduce someone into it with. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're looking at fundamentals, I suppose, like in the way of white belts and relating white belts to free diving, understanding um, breathing and your heart rate, flexibility, all this sort of stuff, all the, all the key things that whether you're starting out or you've mastered the sport um, are always going to be relevant, then, yeah, that's stuff you can start looking at without even stepping a, a toe into the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, even the reason why I say, you know, I ask it, no, I thought uh, I ask it, it's a sport. It's be, it's just because it looks, you know, for me, who, you know, I do, I'm completely ignorant on the subject. 
yeah, it looks it's more life, you know, kind of a lifestyle, right? Mm. Than than anything else. How do you become a professional on your you know and also okay, so we start as white belt, right? So being a black belt, it's when you become professional. Right. Yep. How is that what do you do to become a black belt in, in diving? And how can you uh, be how, how can you make a living of out of that as well? Mm. Um so for free diving, I suppose it's an interesting way to think of it to put a a black belt, like a, a black belt classification on a free diver. I suppose mm. there would probably be some benchmarks. It's it's a hard one because there's with with free diving, it's a a journey w within yourself. Everything you're always competing against yourself. Like um, th there might be people that are like in jujitsu. Exactly. That's why I'm <laughs> finding it hard because it is very similar, actually. But uh -huh. um, I suppose the the way for fr for free diving would be experience o over time and years. You would probably have to at least to some degree, begin to master your control of your own body and your own mind. I think that would probably be the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. you've, you've got a lot of mental battles to get through um, in discovering yourself and what you're afraid of or, or anything from... Like you could take a teenager that, that's coming through without a care in the world type thing and they might be really competitive... Um, they're going to have great natural ability to start off with, but they've got a lot of life lessons that haven't been learnt yet between 18 and 25, 25 and 30, 30 all, all the way up. And, like it's, for, it's a forever learning thing, just like jiu-jitsu, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But all those little lessons that are going to come into play and disrupt and consume um, a lot of their mind, whether, it, whether it's something from their careers, family and emotional problems, that's going to impact their free diving. So they have to, and to be able to overcome that, they need to be able to start to um, be more in control of their mind and their body. Otherwise, they're never going to push through that barrier and reach their potential in free diving. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if everyone would agree with that, but that, that's, that's looking back on it, that's, that's my view on it. I, I had definitely had a, a fair few mental battles over the years that I had to complete first before I really opened some doors to my free diving. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's pretty hard to, to lie face down in a pool, holding your breath for X amount of minutes and your body is screaming at you, telling you to come up and breathe now. Your, your heart rate is lowering. You're having all these things go on in your body that your body does naturally to try and keep you alive. Um, your carbon dioxide's increasing. All these horrible feelings start happening inside your body. If you throw negativity into the mix from something that's happening externally that you haven't dealt with yet, you're going to put so many more roadblocks uh, in front of you. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. So, John, now going going to your world record. So, how that how that works? And in, in please first, yeah, tell tell you know the people who are listening, what was the the world record you broke twice? Uh, so I broke uh, two world records once. Mm -hmm. um, the two world records, one was a fish they call the wahoo. It's a, a long slender um, fish that looks kind of like a, like a mackerel. Um, it weighed in at 62 and a half kilos. Um, it was a bit over two meters long. So it was a, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty large fish. Um, and the second fish was a what they call a dog-toothed tuna. Mm. Um, it's called that because it's got these big gnarly jaws on it, uh, resembling dog's teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th they were the they were the two fish. They were. How big was this one? How heavy? Uh, the dog tooth uh, was one o eight. Yeah, uh, one o nine. Sorry, my mind's oh, going. It's yeah. been that long since I've talked about it. Now, yeah. <laughs> and if I was single, that would be a really good. Picture to have in your Tinder profile, right? With the oh, speed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, I saw the picture. It's impressive. It's so impressive. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah it was um it was a a pretty big milestone in, in spearfishing for me. I mm. definitely come out of the blue, but yeah, it was a um it was 
um, an insane trip. Yeah. Mm. So do you remember that? So what's happened? Do you remember the day? So first of all, that was in the French Polynesia, right? Yeah, that's right. So do you remember that day? So what was the, the preparation towards that? And, and, and also because, okay, so now we talk about uh, the skills of uh, free diving. And now we talk we talk about uh, also the technique, but the, the mindset as well of a hunter, right? Because, mm. you know, it's... How, how much of luck as well it's involved on that to find this fish? How was this this process? Yes. But first, let's start with your mindset. Do you remember the the, the day? Yes, yeah, I do. I do. So um, it was a trip that come up pretty quickly. Um, with Like it wasn't a, a very well um, planned out trip for a long period of time. It got offered and we ended up jumping on a plane and flying over to French Polynesia. But the day itself, um, the Wahoo... I remember waking up in the morning in large anticipation for getting out and um, hunting and, and, and shooting some wahoo because we we dove the day or two previously and we'd um, shot some nice fish, mm -hmm. dived some really nice area. The, 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 I should probably describe the place to start with. It was an amazingly remote area we were in, um, like this large green mountain that come out of the ocean type thing in the middle of nowhere um, with, with locals and that living on it. Mm -hmm. um, but crystal clean water that, you'd, that I'd never even witnessed before, like over 70 metre visibility. Wow. Um, so it could be 50 metres deep and you can see fish and stuff on the bottom swimming around. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I suppose to explain it to someone so they can try and picture it, we, go, we jump in a boat and it, you weave out through all these um, coral caves and bommies through the lagoons and you go through the hard edge, the, the barrier of reef that goes around the island and out into the, the deep water, which was probably around 200 metres deep. And we jump out, out of the boat and we have uh, all our gear with us. So we have some fins, um, fins, wetsuit, snorkel mask, a weight belt. Um, and then we'll have a float which is connected to a line and that's clipped onto our spear gun. So that's if we shoot a fish because they're large fish, we can let go of our guns and it'll take off and we're able to fight the fish without it drowning us. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll throw all that gear out and we'll jump in the water and we'll have a what we call a flasher. It's a, um, a, a device that reflects light and it attracts fish. It makes them think there's like a school of bait fish. So we'll be swimming along on that. And you're really looking for area that, um, that you think the fish that you're targeting might be congregating. So where different currents are meeting or, or where there's bait fish and all this sort of stuff. So on this day, yeah, we, we've went out and we've jumped in the water um, and we had a bit of a quieter morning on this day. We had a couple of schools of fish come through. But um, just before lunchtime, this, um, we had one big shoal come through mm -hmm. and... Um, the guy that was the local guide in the area, so he was the guy that um, took us to this island and he was um, showing us around and, and um, helping us chase these fish. He, he was diving with us and we'd seen the shoal of fish come through and I remember him pointing one of the fish out um, that, that he'd seen and I looked over and it was, it was a, a fish that was much larger than the rest because we were looking for like a fish over 50 kilos. Mm -hmm. um, and... I suppose, yeah, I seen it. I, I took a dive and approached it um, and got closer and closer. And because the visibility was, was so clear, the fish looked a lot closer than it actually mm -hmm. was. Um, and I, I took the shot and I watched my, all like in slow motion to me. I watched my, my spear sail over towards the fish. Whoa. And it just started to drop and then connect low on the jaw. And the fish sped off. So... Um, at, at this stage, the, the fish takes off with the spear, the line and the float and the float comes flying past. So um, it's all systems go. You're, you're freestyling, swimming as fast as you can to catch up to your float. Um, you've got sharks in the water. Mm. So the, the, there's, there's like maybe 20 or 30 sharks swimming around and they're all flying after the fish as well. Cause, wow. Because this, this is dinner time for them. There's, yeah. there's fish <laughs> in the blood. So... Your mission now is to land the fish and get it up to the surface and in the boats before the sharks eat it. Mm. Um, so you're, yeah, you're swimming along and you're, you're playing the fish. 
um, until you can get it up to the surface and then into your arms. Usually once you've got it close to you, you can be a bit more dominant with the sharks and keep the sharks away. Mm. Um, so that, that does go into what you were saying about luck. There is definitely a good degree of luck in, involved in, these, in this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like the, the skill side of it is finding the area, hunting the fish, getting the shot, being able to dive deep enough, having a persona about you that you're relaxed and calm so the fish want to interact with you so you're not giving off a, a, an attitude of that you're aggressive and want to kill. You're just you're there, a, a part of the environment. Mm -hmm. um, so all that side comes into the skill. The luck part is trying to land the fish without a shark eating it um, and, your, uh, and, and the fish just being there on the day as well. And when it comes down to size as well, just that, yeah, that one fish that comes through on the right size. Mm. So, yeah, definitely a degree of luck. Yeah. That's so interesting. So, John, you, you, now we talk about a very high peak of um, you know, excitement and sense of achievement. So how, how was that for you? Um, yeah, it was... It, it was um, it was very interesting, actually, I suppose. It was um, very exciting because we've mm. looked at these fish. We've got them on, on board the boat and there's a possible world record. Um, and we weren't, we weren't there chasing world records at this stage. Um, but it was a... It, it's hard to describe, I suppose. It, it was very exciting in one way. But for me, in, at the time that I was over there and that, I was also there for a bit of a, a break and, and stepping away from everything. And um, so uh, I suppose I was, I was at a bit more of a, um, a lower point in my life. So when, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I took these fish, it was very exciting. But at the same stage, um, I, it was mixed emotions, I suppose, is mm. the best way to describe it. Yeah. Why was a lower point on your life? What was going on on that day? Um, so it wasn't so much this day, but leading up many years in, in the making, leading up to this point, um, I, I haven't talked about this before, so sorry if I'm a little bit weird talking about it, mm. but, um, there was a, um, sorry, um, I suppose, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's so good, my brother. Yeah, just kick. Yeah, please. Um, sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, so about this this lower point in uh, your life, yes. you know, build it up to. Yeah, so. Because I have two extremes, right? So you see the lower point, but at the same time, I mean, you broke the world record in twice. It wasn't even once. Yeah, yeah. so the lower point, um, I, up until this point, for the last probably 10 years, I'd, I'd always um, been battling a fair bit of depression myself. Mm. So. Um, one thing that a lot of people might know about this trip um, and the spearfishing side of it was it was, for me, I, I was getting away and I really needed a break. Um, I'd reached my absolute limit at this stage. Um, I was in a pretty bad way mentally and so part of this trip was for me to, to get away from everything um, and just put myself back into the ocean somewhere raw and try and just find some peace of mind for a bit. Mm. Um, so that was why we weren't there hunting world records at the time. It was just a spearfishing trip and, and getting away. But the fact that this come on and then we'd taken these amazing fish was where the mixed emotions come from. We had two extremes. We've had, I'm taking two world records, which is like the high of highs for some of my life. But to be totally honest, two weeks earlier, um, I was... I was suicidal two weeks earlier. Wow. Yeah, um, there I had a. It was a culmination of a lot of um, mental health issues I'd been battling for years and years, and they come to a head um, in the months leading up to this trip. And it got to the stage where um, I was just admitting that I had a problem and needing and, and having to face it all, and that that just really really started to break me. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I suppose that, that, that was, um, that's why I, I found it hard to answer what the emotions were like. It was one of the, one of the most amazing things I've done in my life, but I was also, um, fighting pretty hard at that stage just for my own mental health and that, that trip as well. Yeah. 
Wow, do not a contrast. And how do, how did you how did you cope with that? So what's what was the the the, the transition for you from you know think think about a suicide, mm. you know, and, and to be able to go and have this this um, the amazing experience. So this, that's probably the interesting part is that the transition it wasn't a um, the the amazing experience happened while all this was going on. Mm. Um, but it it's was, a sign of nature, you know. Say, hey, oh, you know, yeah, relax, you know, it's everything's gonna be okay. Yeah, I think that that's. I, I definitely took a lot of that away from it. Um, mm. It was almost like a, um, a a rite of passage, I suppose. In a way, it, it felt like for me to come to be at the lowest of lows and to take myself out of the environment I was in and put myself back into something that was just so raw and natural to me, the ocean and free diving. There's mm -hmm. no thinking about the outside world. There's breathing, holding your breath, interacting with fish and nature. Mm -hmm. um, so to remove myself out of all that and then back into it and then have that world that I've put so much into for so many years give back to me with such an amazing experience, it, it sent me home with a a very different point of point of view on, on everything, I suppose, to say. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of hard work ahead of me and everything still because it was just something, this is why it all boiled over at this stage and was um, it just all happened, came to a head on this one trip. But I suppose what I'm trying to say is I find it almost scary to think what would have happened if I missed this opportunity and never made it on that trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And how was the, the point when you did you did you look for help? Uh, what was the realization when you was depressed and you know had suicidal thoughts? Yep. What when was the, the turning point when you have this realization, hey, I need some help or I need to talk to someone? Did you did you look for that or was something you was trying to going through and find some answers and Yeah, I think um that's probably the point where I was saying um just admitting that there's a, an issue that needs to be dealt with, mm. I suppose, was, was where it all come crashing down a bit. Because it was probably 10 years at this stage I've been dealing with it, living with it every day type thing. But mm -hmm. I grew up in a, I suppose, with a mindset, was brought up with a mindset of be strong, be tough, get on with it. Yeah. Don't be, don't worry about that sort of stuff. You're not in touch with your emotional feelings and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's only so much you can bed that down and ignore it and and use whether it's sports extreme adventure all this sort of stuff to distract you from this and push you mm. into other areas but sooner or later it's going to become something that comes to the surface whether you like it or not and i suppose me admitting it and starting to talk to people about it was the part that started to boil over um yeah as soon as i i do remember as soon as i actually sat down with a good friend um, and my family, and actually said that look, I've got, I've got some um, problems I need help with. I don't, I can't really help myself anymore. Um, that was the point that brought everything out, and uh, it was almost like the, the, the storm, I suppose, come through all at once at, at that stage, and it was the beginning of of myself and the journey that I'm on now with um, self improvement and constant management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, John, thank you so much for sharing the, this this story. I didn't know that as well because, yeah, it, it's so it's so hard. You know, see, oh, we never know what's going on on, on you know, people's life. You know, we just see you know you posing with that massive fish on your on your hands, and you know people had no idea what you was going through just days before. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something I haven't talked about really before, and I appreciate the opportunity to on a on a something like this to talk about it if, mm. if uh, the reason I chose to talk about it I, I suppose is I almost feel bad in a way that I haven't before now I have a lot of friends that deal with this sort of stuff as well mm -hmm. um, and if like anyone anyone listening to this or anyone that knows me personally should know that they can come and talk to me about this sort of stuff and know mm -hmm. that myself turning around and talking to others is, is what turned me around I've, I've, I've been there if you're going through it um, I 
I can I can understand to a degree at least what I went through. Mm-hmm. Um, so if if by talking about it is going to help someone else, then yeah, a hundred percent will. Yeah, hundred percent will. Yeah, thank you, thank you again. And you know, it's that ugly ugly side of our culture. You know, when it's 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 that. You know, especially for men. You know, we we have this ugly side of uh, yeah, you should you know not showing feelings and blah blah blah. And you yeah. know, that's I think that's such a old school way we need to move on and i think the the way we can move on is exactly you know doing things like you're doing right now you know being open and talking about it. Mm-hmm. and also yeah me too i'm here you know to to listen to help as much as as much as possible as well yeah that's so so awesome so john um yeah man holy that's <laughs> yeah it's not always um, that's it's, what what you see is not powerful. always what you get really eh? yeah a lot of people will see two fish and two world records and a perfect trip but not understand um what else might be going on in the background so mm. don't don't judge a book by its cover and give people never. the time of day i never I think yeah yeah never know what someone's going through that's so brave it's so brave so john yeah my friend holy that was super cool man i wasn't expect for that as well that's super cool you know the fishing diving you know all those things it's a type of um yeah it seems to me it's a type of a very strong way to meditate as well and you know, under under the water and um yeah and especially in, in in place like new zealand you know when it's such a common uh way for lots of guys you know to to have their time as well to go to the ocean and have the time for themselves and, and enjoy that. This is why I said for me it's hard to see as a sport, you know, because yep. it seems such a yeah, such a natural thing, you know, to to do. Yeah, it it, it is. Um, I suppose a, a good chunk of the people that I I dive with and, and call close friends and family for me, we, we don't really ever look at it as a sport. Mm. For us, it's it, it is a lot more of a way of life. We yeah. we use it for. Um, Number one, collecting food for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, ah, that's such a good point. Yeah, yeah about so, the food. Yeah, what yeah. do you do for the fish? Right, the fish, right? Yeah, well, that's what it's for. It's for eating. Mm. At the end of the day, um, like we, might, apart from the odd occasion where we might need to get some, um, some some special ingredient or, or or something for a special occasion, my partner and I, we haven't we haven't bought any meat for nearly five years now. <laughs> Really? We no, we don't. We don't buy commercial meat. It's it, it's what we can get from the ocean or what I can hunt in the mountains. Uh. Um, I've f- full accountability, I suppose, and of of what you're eating, where it's come from, what it's got in it. It's natural. Um, it's you're you're spending time and effort to to take this um, mm. food that you're 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 getting. Um, that that's a big big part of it for us. Yeah, mm. de- definitely the food side. Um, but also it's, um, somewhere that we just, the ocean itself, it's a, it's a big relaxer for us. It's somewhere we can share Mm. time and energy. And I think I read actually in Hicks and Gracie's book, he he had a little Mm. phrase in there. I posted it not so long ago and he talks about the ocean being his ultimate equalizer. If he's got too much energy, he goes to the ocean and he comes out and he feels relaxed. Mm -hmm. If he's got, um... If he's feeling tired, he goes to the ocean, has a swim, he comes out and he'll feel energized. Mm-hmm. And I, when I read that, I, I, I thought that was that's something that resonated with me very well. It is this almost like this its own energy type thing that we, you develop a deep connection with over time as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so those are the, the, yeah, all those things, you know, when you was telling us about those those techniques or those stories, yeah. Yeah, we 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 experience those type of things in jiu-jitsu as well. Not dealing with pressure. You know, if someone's on the top of you, right, trying to choke you, you panic. You spend more energy than you should. Yep. Yeah, it's so interesting. You know those those similarities. Huh? Yeah, yeah. In, like, uh, I'm so new to jiu-jitsu at the moment, but every there's so so often I'm finding these these little strings that I can, from lessons that I've learned from more high level in spear fishing and free diving, uh, straight across to jiu-jitsu. There's, I suppose you probably go across in a number of different sports, but there are, um, with relaxation, anything to do with breathing, mm-hmm. heart rate, being comfortable, um, 
finding comfort in uncomfortable positions, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. That's awesome. So, John, um, have a few few questions here for us to wrap it up. So, before before we finish, him, do you cry? Do I cry? Yeah, I have for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When was the last time you did cry? Uh, oh, last time I cried would have been. Um, when I was being overwhelmed with just daily emotion at home, mm -hmm. trying to talk to my partner, my, uh, my girlfriend Hillary. Um, it was... Because I, I still, like we talked about mental health and depression and that, it's yeah. something I'll, I'll have to manage for the rest of my life. It's, it's not something that just goes away for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I do manage it on the daily um, and yeah, every now and then it might boil over and that, but as I, the older I get and the more I work on myself, I can recognize stuff now and, and, and manage it. But every now and then, yeah, the last time I cried, I would have been, um, when everything was too much and I just couldn't handle it anymore and I needed my partner to, to step in and, and help me out with a few things. Um, that, that was, yeah, sometime last year, I suppose, for sure. Ah, uh, that's awesome. Mm. That's super cool. Um, I have an important question here from my wife. She asked to ask you uh, if you would do well at Survivor, that program, that TV show. The TV show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think the surviving side, yeah. I, I, I yes, definitely the survive on an island. Uh, the hunting and the diving and all that sort of stuff. But there's a lot of politics in those shows as well and I, I'm the worst with politics I, I turn off and walk away so uh, I, I wouldn't be the type of person that would build any alliances or <laughs> I would probably be the person everyone thought was useless spending too much time out in the water swimming and having a good time uh, yeah, I'm not sure because you're a type of person I would love you know it would be important to, to be to have around to learn from right yeah maybe yeah, yeah maybe. that's super cool so yeah so she loved those programs I, I, ne I never watched but she yeah she loves the I don't I, even I, she had to explain to me what it was about um, another question here so which question um, I should ask you and I, and I didn't? Ooh. Um, I, I find out, I, I was trying to have a think of this a few beforehand and I couldn't really think. I actually asked my partner, Hillary, um, what she would want to know about me if she didn't know me so well. Oh, I love that. Um, you know, how, what was your answer? So she had a, she had a couple. Her, her one was how... How do I manage my mental health on a, on a daily now? Mm. Was one of the ones. Um, okay, so I love that. You like that Please. One? Um, so, for that one there, I think it, it's it's all it's a bit more natural for me now on how it is. But if I was to break it down, um, I've learned to be a lot more in tune with my body and my mind in regards to my mental health. There's mm -hmm. telltale signs. If I'm getting panicky, if I find myself shallow breathing a lot, mm -hmm. um, if 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 I sh I suppose what I should say is if my if I do see signs of my mental health going downhill now, I have to drop everything and go straight back to the fundamentals: my diet, my exercise, mm -hmm. um, connections, connection with people, with people mm. all, all these sort of things. Um, spending time in the ocean or away hunting is a big thing. If I don't go hunting or spear fishing for months at a time, I'll start to decline and I need to go away and spend some time by myself walking around or diving, just finding silence and um, finding some mental clarity, I suppose, without all the distractions of everyday life. Mm -hmm. So finding all the little cues of when stuff's starting to get me down and noticing it has been a big learning curve for me. Um, and then turning it around pretty quickly to make sure I don't have dig myself a big hole to climb up out of again. Yeah. But also talking talking to people is a big thing. Talking to my partner, letting her know if I'm not feeling well, mm -hmm. and then also holding myself accountable that I've got a, I've the, I'm not feeling well, and it's up to me to fix this now. Um, for to make sure the people around me, I'm not not. Um, 
I, I, to make sure I'm pulling my own weight, I suppose, is, is the big thing. So, yeah, talking to people and accepting help, but also holding yourself accountable that you're the person that's going to need to put in the work here. And if you've been slacking on your exercise or your diet or spending time on yourself, mm-hmm. you, or the reason to blame at this stage, if, if, if you're at a stage where you know yourself well enough, you've got to put in the work. Yeah. Wow, that's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. Big lessons. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. What was the second question? That was the first one. What I love it. The second question. Um, I think we might have covered the se- She's covered the other ones. She said, uh, asked me about my relation, uh, how my relationship with freediving started. Mm-hmm. I think we, we pretty much covered that, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Um, that was the other one. So she also asked, um, I, as, a, as a question or more of a statement that um, I kill fish. I take animals' lives. What's what's the process behind that, and how do I feel about it? Wow, I love this question. Mm. Mm. So it it is a very interesting question. Yeah, uh, I, I, honestly, sorry, I, I'm just I was thinking about that, but um, I was thinking, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's a, you know that would be a um, kind of for the people who are passionate about it. You know, if that would be offensive to them. Yeah, but I was be. thinking it, about it a, a yeah, lot have. about this. Yeah, yeah, because I have this, yeah, this thing of, you know, yeah, you kill an animal. Uh, mean, I, I, so you can have an idea. No, I'm so paranoid. Not, not paranoid, but it's the, the kind of the, um, make sure I pay the respect, you know. So I, I don't pray, but I always, you know, be grateful, you know, when I put my hands together before I eat, you know, doesn't matter where I go, you know, I always do that, you know, as a... Yep. But, you know, we learned this as a, as a child, you know, so what's, what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, it's, I, mean, I mean, first and foremost, for, for hunting and spearfishing for me, it, it, it's food. If I'm taking, if I'm taking life now, it, it, it is for food. It, it's not a competitive nature. There was once upon a time when I was, when I was younger um, and competing with people, it was always food but mm. there was a lot more competitive nature, the thrill of the hunt and all that sort of stuff mm. that come with it as Who well. Who gets the biggest one and yeah. all of that. So. But mm. n- no, not so much these days. F- now it, it is um, like there is a great deal of respect, respect for the animals that we do take for food. It's probably, it'll be something hard for some people to understand mm-hmm. that yes, we're taking a life and that we can respect it at the same time. But it, it, it is exactly that. We, we live in this, we, we enter this world, whether it's the mountains or the ocean, and we, we love that environment. We have so much respect for it. If I had to live with it or without it, mm. I, I, I would choose with it every time. And, and if, if, if living with it meant I could not take any animals anymore, that's mm-hmm. okay. I, I don't need to take any more animals anymore if I can still go and experience that place. Yeah. But for me food from the ocean and the mountains is something I've always done and it's something I always will do. We eat. It's a natural way. A lot of the animals that I take, especially hunting in the mountains, they're all known as pests here. And there's programs where they are poisoning um, animals and on mass scales to try and keep the numbers down to protect the vegetation. And to me, that, that is a total waste. You, you, you've got life mm. running around in the mountains, what living itself... And we've got people going hungry in the streets. We've, we've got, like, yes, it's a little bit more effort and maybe a little bit more money to go and recover the meat than it would be just to poison stuff like that. But that doesn't make it okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, f- for me, it, it, f- first and foremost, it is food, but we do have total respect for the animal. Most of the hunting I do is bow hunting. So it's a close and intimate um, experience. And... It's something that we're not like it. You're shooting to kill, not wound, and we will we will pull out and walk home empty-handed before we risk um, leaving a, a, an injured animal or anything that's um, going to be left in the wild. It, it's everything is supposed to be a quick, clean kill, so you can share the food on your plate with your family at home without any unnecessary or. Um, um, pain for for the animal, yeah. But the respect side, I suppose, is something that is pretty hard to to understand. But 
we spend hours in the bush just walking around observing taking photos looking at stuff it's it's like i said if if i was presented the choice that you can have the mountains um but not take animals anymore or you lose it all i would happily walk into the mountains without anything to hunt Mm-hmm. Every day of the week, yeah, it's a, that. That's where the respect comes from. Mm, I love that. Yeah, that's so interesting. And what, um, your name, the name of your partner is Hillary. Hillary. Yeah. Hillary. Shout out to Hillary for those two awesome questions. Thank you, Hillary. <laughs> that's so awesome. So, John, to finish, my brother, what's the what's the that damn? Let's take a deep breath now because that's gonna be a big one. <laughs> what's the meaning of life? Oh. What life is about? What's yeah? Why 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 were you here? What's the meaning of life? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I wasn't ready for that one. Uh, for me, for me now, the the meaning of life is learning and absorbing of as much that you can that interests you, um, and stuff that you're passionate about. Pushing in a direction um, constantly until the very end, I suppose. That's um, if that makes sense for me. Everyone's going to be different. Everyone's uh, for me. I don't think there's any one meaning to life, but overall, for me, it's the journey. I suppose, yeah. Mm. Finding something you're passionate about and following, pulling at that thread and following it until you fall over <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's awesome that's super cool so john thank you thank you thank you yeah super cool you know i always say to to people you know the the, the podcast is it's um yeah it's so close to my heart because of his stories like like he, yours and, and thank you for sharing that no worries i really appreciate it and i'm pretty sure i can't wait to share this with our community uh, i hope it was helpful yes yeah. it was very very helpful very brave as well for you for sharing your story so yeah i do appreciate that a lot my brother thank you yeah. so much no worries and i see you soon on the mat sir uh definitely <laughs> yeah i'll be back awesome thank you so much john thank you thank you